Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Free Marketeers podcast. Welcome to our latest episode. Uh, today, I'm joined by our UK correspondent, Mr. Alexander Hammond from the Institute for Economic Affairs in London. Alex, thanks for being back with us. Hi, Chris. Great to be here. Alex, I thought we'd start off um, just about the UK lockdown, if you wanted to chat about that for a few seconds, um, and then we can get on to sort of broader topics, the main focus of the show. But as you're on this week, I thought we would at least get your perspective on what's happening, because as far as I know, the UK is back in hard lockdown. So over to you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, beginning of this week, it was announced a full lockdown is going back into place, um, in large part thanks to increased cases, which seems to be caused by the new strain of the virus, um, which is quite sad because at the end of November, beginning of December, it seemed like we were doing really well against the virus. Cases were dropping quite substantially when the new strain came along and cases are through the roof. Um, the lockdown will be reviewed in, on around the 15th of February. Um, they hope by that point enough people would have had the first doses of a vaccine that they can begin to liberalize things. Um, however, we'll see how that goes. But there are lots of vaccines around. Um, the vaccine's being pushed out as quickly as possible. Um, so hopefully that means the end is in sight, finally. And just regarding sort of day-to-day -day, um, shops, that kind of thing, are they closed? Can you, I mean, when you go out, do you have to sort of get a pass or something? As far as I know, in France, when they did the first lockdown, you had sort of what's been termed a freedom pass, but is anything like that in the UK? No, we don't have a pass. Um, there are only a few um, reasons that we're allowed to go outside um, and to leave our home. One is for exercise, to get essential goods like food and medicine. So some shops are open, big super or supermarkets and small uh, food corner stores, off licenses, things like that. Um, but things like clothes shops and various other shops are closed. Um, and you are able to go to work in some circumstances. Construction workers are still allowed to go to work. Um, and it's a bit vague, but they say if you, can, if you can't reasonably work from home, you are able to go in. But it has meant the vast majority of people are staying at home um, and are leaving only sporadically. Okay, well, obviously I'm in full agreement with you. One can only hope that at some point we're, all the countries are going to turn some kind of corner. It seems like Eastern countries are doing relatively better than Western countries at the moment. Um, just shifting to South Africa, um, for the viewers and listeners, I just wanted to mention one interesting, I guess, noteworthy uh, news item from the past week regarding lockdowns. In South Africa, um, the police minister, Beki Kele, he said that foreign nationals from Europe um, who were arrested for being in contravention of level three lockdown regulations by going to the beach in the Western Cape were undermining the authority of the South African state. And on that point, I just want to say, if people going to the beach undermines the state, then I don't know if the state has much legitimacy. That'll make my anarchist friends very happy. Um, but I also think the South African government has done itself no favors through the last year by the arbitrary regulations they've imposed, like banning the sale of alcohol and tobacco. I think they've undermined their own authority regarding the lockdown in any case. So the minister should maybe see what his colleagues are doing in terms of regulations. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that kind of thing, but you know, well, the well, Europeans coming here and us arresting them on our beaches. So. <laughs> well, technically, Chris, uh, Brexit has now happened, so I can't speak on behalf of the Europeans. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, of course, we're still in Europe, <laughs> just not in the EU. Um, well, going to the beaches, it's a bit of a tough one. You're in the middle of nowhere. Probably no mm -hmm. one is in tens of meters from you. So you're not really spreading the virus or at risk of catching it. But then again, I guess you could argue if everyone was to do that, there would be a problem. Right. Um, so yeah, it's not ideal, but I don't understand why South Africa has decided, the South African government that is, um, I'm sure the people do not agree, have decided to ban the sale of alcohol. Um, it seems in times of COVID, that <laughs> has been a, a little hope. Some people have had a glass of wine on a Friday evening yeah. um, to take that away. I don't see the logic behind that um, at all. To me, the biggest element of that is just the loss of um, tax revenue. Um, and we know the South African fiscus is under a lot of pressure in any case, but you lose that revenue that you could be using for service delivery. And when we're told that the healthcare sector is under a lot of pressure, uh, that they don't have the resources they need, why not at least have some revenue that you can bolster that sector? So it's a bit of a, 
I think it sort of defeats itself in a way. Um, I know that maybe the government also just feels they have to be seen to be doing something. It's that sort of avenue that uh, politicians and bureaucrats get lost in. They feel they have to be seen to be taking action, even when the action doesn't necessarily attain the goals that they aim for. Yeah, agreed. And I'm sure, I don't know for certain, but I'm sure in South Africa, alcohol duties and VAT on alcohol is relatively high. Yeah. So who knows how much money they're losing. You should try and encourage as much consumption, maybe not as much consumption of alcohol as possible, but right. as much consumption as possible to firstly get the economy going and be to also sort out the government's deficit and debt. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then just two more South African news items before we get onto our main topic of trade. Um, Elon Musk, um, South African born gentleman from Pretoria. The meme goes that it just show, goes to show that you have to leave Pretoria to make a success of your life. Um, he is now the world's richest person. And this was confirmed on Thursday. Shares of his company Tesla surged 7.9%, boosting Musk past Amazon founder Jeff Bezos on the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Musk is worth $194.8 billion or $9.5 billion more than Bezos. Um, congratulations to Musk. I think it's a remarkable achievement. Um, and of course, a lot of people are joking now on social media, asking Musk to come and help out the South African government. But I guess he had his reasons for leaving. Yeah, and I guess it just shows, firstly, that entrepreneurs will move to the most um, kind business environment possible. Um, but I, I don't know if I'm alone in thinking this, but I understand Elon Musk, brilliant, Tesla doing great work, SpaceX doing great work. But is it really adding as much value to our lives as Amazon is? Like, I, I, I'm not sure where this is, why it's so, he's so much richer than Bezos now. Well, um, isn't value I, subjective after all? No, it is. I, it <laughs> is completely. And that does explain it because it's, it's the, the reason he's now the richest is because the stock increased so mm, much mm. on Tesla. And I think a lot of the people buying stock, obviously, I'm sure some doing it for very sound financial reasons, but a lot of people are just really big fans of Tesla yeah. and what they're doing and love Elon Musk. So you are right. It is quite subjective. Um, but I would argue Amazon maybe hasn't, sorry, Tesla hasn't bought as much value yeah. as Amazon has yet. Um, but yeah, he's, people love Elon and he's now the richest man because of it. And of course, because of the great work he's doing. Yeah. And then our final South African uh, sort of short news item is just around vaccines on Monday. It was Monday or Tuesday of this week, or well, today is the 8th of January. So earlier this week, I did a bit of a, an update on South Africa's vaccine situation after a, an address by the Minister of Health, uh, Zoelim Kize. Um, so the latest news we have is that South Africa has secured a COVID-19 vaccine for healthcare workers uh, with 1 million doses of the Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine due to arrive in January and a further 500,000 in February. This follows successful negotiations with the Serum Institute of India, the manufacturer of the vaccine. And then finally, private medical aid Discovery Health anticipate it will, it anticipates that it will cost an upper limit of 7 billion rand for medical schemes to fund COVID-19 vaccines for 7.1 million of their own members, as well as to subsidize an equal number of non-members in the public sector. So after initially it seemed the government's vaccine plan wasn't um, very detailed. Um, there wasn't that much around how it was gonna roll out, who was gonna get it first, how they were gonna pay for it. There were even questions around negotiations with all these companies and initiatives like COVAX. In the last week, it seems now the private sector is sort of trying to come to the party and help out the government as much as, much as possible. Uh, I think the UK is doing quite well with well, relatively compared to South Africa with its sort of vaccine plans. Yeah, so in the UK, we've been, com been complaining a lot recently about the vaccine rollout, complaining it's been too slow mm. um, and that it could be more efficient. And it could be. We've yet to open the stadiums, the big arenas, um, and say, for example, Public Health England isn't working on Sundays at the moment. So there's a lot of things we could be doing. However, we have done about um, 1.3 million doses so far, which is more than all of uh, the EU put together. So we, we are happy to complain that it's not going as fast as it could, and it isn't going as fast as it theoretically could, but yes, relatively we're doing well. Um, with the South African doses, I mean, it's great news that they've got some finally, but 
it doesn't seem like very much to me in a country of 58 million people thereabouts. It's only 750,000 uh, actually vaccines, so 1.5 million doses. Um, so, and, and if you even if you compare that to Kenya, I, I saw recently Kenya's got 24 million uh, doses coming in the next month. So, I hope the South African government, even though it's expensive, even though there's huge debts, huge deficits at the moment, I really think the vaccine is worth it because the lockdown, in my view, is far, far, far more harmful than the cost of a vaccine will be. Each day lockdown or any weird form of lockdown continues is a lot of money being lost. And I think the investment on the vaccine will quickly recuperate itself. Yeah, I think that's a good a good point, an important point to raise, the sort of cost-benefit analysis sort of idea. I mean, lockdowns are never ideal, but then let's get the vaccine rolled out quickly, as quickly as possible, and then we can hopefully end lockdowns. I mean, I also think the most authoritarian types in the government want to keep at least some element of lockdown for as long as they can to, quote-unquote, protect the people. So you even wonder if we do roll out the vaccine, whether they'll still accept that we you know should then lift the lockdown more progressively i'm not sure what they think in terms of of numbers and you know and getting herd immunity i'm not sure what the number is out of 50 million um, but i think for now their main focus is just to give it to healthcare workers and sort of try and protect them as as well as possible because our public healthcare sector is under a lot of strain apparently yeah ours is too at the moment in the uk um but i think the worry with continuing lockdowns is that the South African government might not be considering the human cost of lockdown yeah. in the sense. Uh, I don't know if the data in South Africa is out, but in other comparable countries, suicides have increased dramatically. We don't know the long term impact on mental health. This is having it happening. So it's not just for COVID numbers. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of other things to think about, which makes it even more complicated. That's why telling these big grand narratives about COVID yeah it's tough because as it gets more complex it's harder to understand the, the narrative the model um so we have to resort to focusing on the little things like getting vaccines out trying to stop lockdown as quickly as possible but there's so many cost and benefits it's mm. an impossible task <laughs> is, is the vaccine compulsory in the uk because our the minister of health said i think yesterday or the day before he did say no one will be forced to take it which i did think was an interesting note again from what i think is a pretty authoritarian government and no, in the uk it's not compulsory okay. no um maybe in months time they might attach freedoms to it right, you can right, only go right. to this concert um if you have a vaccine or travel on this plane if you have a vaccine but at the moment no there's been no signs of that well, i know Qantas. i mean just one airline as an example i think they've made it clear even months ago that you need to have had the vaccine before you can fly well, I guess in that case, they'll be waiting a long time for passengers because, because at the moment, for the next few months, it's just going to be the very elderly and very vulnerable getting the vaccine. So mm -hmm. sure, they might be able to fly, but that's a very small percentage of your population. I think the people who are more keen to travel as quickly as possible are the, young, uh, the younger generation. So, and then likely not to get the vaccine even in the UK and US until June, July, August. Um, so it seems like in, maybe they'll go back on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, that, there's just a few news items for, for the viewers and listeners. Um, now we'll get into our sort of main topic for today. And, the best uh, news of 2020. There we go. So far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> only upwards from here, right? It can only, it can, it, it started very well and it can, it can only get better. Um, on the 1st of January of this year, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area sort of quote unquote became operational. You'll have to help me with the terminology here because it can be quite complicated. The agreement has been sort of in place since 2018, I think. Um, been, the, there's been um, signed on by 54 of the 55 African Union states who signed the agreement. Only Eritrea did not sign. Of these member states, 27 have deposited their instrument of ratification the agreement well, it's a bit it's a bit more than that now chris <laughs> oh, sorry go ahead i <laughs> know uh, um so it's about 34 who have okay. done it so far and 37 ish is what i'd say mm -hmm. uh, 34 have fully ratified and three more in their parliaments have basically oh, okay. sorted out the procedures 
So we're expecting it soon. So about okay, 37-ish. Yeah. Okay. Um, then just a few more details. Um, and again, feel free to jump in. The agreement initially requires members to remove 90%, uh, sorry, to remove tariffs from 90% of goods, allowing free access to commodities, goods, and services across the continent. The United Nations Economic Commission for Africa estimates that the agreement will boost intra-African trade by 52% by 2022. Um, and then just some issues that remain to be negotiated include the schedule of tariff concessions and other specific commitments. Negotiations are also underway to see which city will host the um, sort of be the, I guess, the, the seat of it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So Alex, over to you. I mean, is this the dawn of a, an African sort of century, I guess, of free trade? Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Potentially is what I'll say. So it was first, uh, using the word introduced is hard because you think mm. it means it went into place. But right. in 2018, in March, Paul Kagame, um, who was the head of the AU at the time, um, basically put the document on the table, opened it up to signatures and ratifications. Um, after about a year and a bit, it managed to get 22 ratifications, mm -hmm. which meant uh, in a year's time it would then be implemented. COVID delayed it slightly, so it's now implemented on January 1st this year. And what that means, 90% of tariffs will be removed. However, it will be done within five to 10 years. Okay. Um, five years if you're a non, if you count as a non less developed country, 10 years if you're a less developed country. But then within 13 years, 97% mm. of tariffs on goods will be removed. So it's a bit complicated, but hopefully all this means in 2030, uh, 2034, which I know is a long way <laughs> away now, but 2034, 90% of tariffs on goods traded between member states will be abolished. And so far it has been ratified by most of the big players, South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, them alone make up a third of the continent's economy, mm -hmm. Kenya, Angola, a lot of the big players, the only one who hasn't really, one of the big players that hasn't ratified it is Algeria. Um, they have signed on and I don't know if they plan on ratifying it very soon. Uh, maybe it'll be in a few years. But it's great news for the continent. It's, it will increase inter-African trade. The World Bank has did an enormously generous prediction of what it could be, which is very unlike the World Bank in my experience. The World Bank doesn't seem to be overtly optimistic when it comes to trade agreements or trade areas and the impacts of free trade. But what the World Bank suggested is that by 2035, if the agreement was fully enacted and had all the member states sign on, um, and even though Eritrea might not sign on, their economy is so small, it probably doesn't impact these predictions that much. But they predicted that 30 million people could be lifted from extreme poverty. And that accounts for what close to 7.5% of all people in extreme poverty in Africa. A further 68 million people could rise from moderate poverty. So that's below $5.50 uh, per day. And extreme poverty is $1.90. It could add uh, almost half a trillion to the continent's economy, 150 billion. Um, and increase wages as well by about 10% for both men and, men and women and for both unskilled and skilled workers. With the poorest countries, the World Bank said, will experience the greatest benefits. So it's great news. There are some issues, but yeah, let, let me know. What, you, what, what are your thoughts on it, Chris? <laughs> no, I think the numbers you provide are quite staggering and give me a lot of hope. I mean, for I think a lot of us coming out of 2020, we sort of weren't sure where countries would go now. And the fact that this area can now point Africa in a different direction to what it might have been used to for decades is to me very uplifting. I did want to ask you, I mean, I'll give you my thoughts as well, but one thing I wanted to ask you before I forget is just moving away a bit from the numbers, just the ideological shift that this might indicate for the African continent and for African governments. Do you think now, I'm not, you know, not that I want to say Africa is going to be this grand libertarian utopia or anything like that, but sort of what, it's, what it tells you about where Africa might be going. Yeah, and I think it is important to step away from the numbers because although these rapid gains are enormously impressive in themselves, mm. 
ultimately, ultimately, it is their numbers and the predictions of the benefits are down to the fact that Africa as a whole would be moving away from the policies that kept it impoverished for so long. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the most important benefits of the trade area that isn't actually talked about all that much is that since independence, um, Africa has been plagued by socialism and economic uh, nationalism. And very early on, even prior to independence, it was thought that socialism was the main route to prosperity. Um, that's what Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana suggested. He thought that only a socialist transformation of Ghana would eradicate the col- colonial structure and push it into riches, essentially. And he encouraged lots of other states to follow suit, um, to pursue independence so that they could pursue socialism. And what that comes down to is in a, in, a, in a way that they saw capitalism and colonialism as synonymous, as one and the same. So as colonialism was being banished from Africa and is evil in itself, so too they thought was capitalism. And the result of that was across the continent, a wave of various different ideologies took hold. In Republic of Congo, they adopted scientific uh, socialism. In Guinea, they adopted Marxism in African clothes, and they pledged to prevent any accumulation of wealth. Um, In Senegal, Senghor said he, uh, an independent Senegal would be guided by Marx and Engels. Um, And Tanzania, they pledged themselves as a socialist state and pursued their form of socialism. And and Nkrumah himself came up with Nkrumahism, a a, a peculiar form of African socialism. He set up an ideological institute to push for it. Um, So that's what started the independence journey for many states. And in a way, actually, socialism led to one-partyism, the norm of one-parties, because a lot of these early leaders saw uh, the two-party system as a result of competition between the various socioeconomic classes. And in their mind, because Africa was classless, it therefore didn't need two parties. It was fine with one, which we know is... uh, had some quite tragic consequences in the decades since but the legacy that left was that it created a norm of big centrally planned economies price controls um, land expropriation which South Africa is currently fighting with um, big state-owned industries um, and that became a norm um, across Africa but that is seems to maybe be changing And I'm not saying that Africa won't be plagued by economic nationalism or socialism again. It definitely will pop up in various different areas. Land expropriation in South Africa is one example of that. But as a whole, it does seem that there is an ideological shift. And I think that's best represented if we look at the African Union itself today, and then the organization of African Union back in the 1963, when it was set up. It was initially set up by Nkrumah Nyerere in Tanzania on the idea that it could create a united, a quote, a united socialist Africa. And they thought it was the only, it was the necessary condition to have the African personality. And as a result, it was guided by, unsurprisingly, by their form of African socialism. Whereas that's how it started. That's their ideas on how it started. Whereas today, we fast forward a few decades, the African Union, the successor of the Organization of African Unity, has now just implemented the world's largest free trade area. And Paul Kagame, who was leader when it was first put forward to sign, um, said he's an avid free trader. Ramaphosa, uh, the current chairperson and leader of South Africa, said free trade could unleash Africa's economic potential. Now, I'm not really supporting these guys in a way at all really um but i think it does show there's been an ideological shift amongst african leaders from socialism state control of everything to now embracing free trade private enterprise and hopefully as a result they will experience the great benefits of this um yeah i like talking about the 
more abstract intangible aspects of policies and that kind of thing but one thing you know that i really wanted to highlight and i think it taps into what you said about the ideology is just how you know this sort of area this agreement could hopefully lead to the exchange of just skills and human capital and ingenuity never mind the flow of goods and services and that kind of thing but when you have something like this underpinning how countries interact with each other hopefully it could lead to more, more cooperation um, and just the lowering of barriers to innovation of course we want lower uh, barriers to trade we want lower tariffs those are concrete examples of how we can measure the success of this agreement or not um, but i'm very excited just about the human capital and the human potential of africa and seeing that unlocked after centuries of it either being taken away from the continent or just being exploited by the government on the continent kind of thing so you know i don't want to pin the continent's hopes on the agreement itself it's up to people and governments to implement it and carry it forward it's up to them to actually actualize the potential thereof so we have to see if they carry it out or not but you know i really want to support your point around the ideological shift and what it could mean what it could signal for the continent i mean at the end of the day uh, Africans living now in poverty, especially that's been exacerbated after the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdowns, they're not going to be lifted out of poverty long term by redistributionism. I mean, many African governments are themselves running out of fiscal space, so they simply cannot spend to the extent that they could and invest in infrastructure and that kind of thing. The only way you're going to get people sort of lifted up is by freeing up economies. And I hope that the free trade agreement and area are part of a bigger picture of African economies being freed up. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And one hope of this is, is that the big free trade area could encourage a lot of investment. Because mm. at, at the moment, there isn't much sense for, say, a fa as someone wanting to set up a factory going to a small African nation right. to set it up. Because then getting their goods out of the country would take it cost a lot and the various tariffs and barriers and time. Whereas if they can go to this small country and then they've got an entire market of 1.3 billion people mm -hmm. that could potentially be in the free trade area, there's suddenly an incentive for them to do so. They go in there, set up factories um, and almost <laughs> in a way create Africa's industrialization, industrial yeah. revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that when African countries trade with each other they're three times more likely to be um higher valued manufactured goods so that's that's great if that means if the free trade area increases into african trade which is already very low it's only about 18 percent of exports in africa go to other african countries in in europe it's 59 percent and i think in asia actually i think in europe it's 69 percent in asia it's 59 percent um so increasing that is great it means more manufactured goods are being exported. And what that means is at the moment, a lot of countries in Africa, I think about three quarters of African countries, 70% or more of their exports are commodities, mm -hmm. which are highly dependent on various price fluctuations, um, which makes their business environment in the country as a whole quite unstable, or it can do. Whereas if we can diversify their exports, create the factories, Finally, the last frontier of um, the world that hasn't experienced rapid industrialization can do so. Um, and I, 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 just the human benefit of that would be immense. We, we've seen what's happened in Southeast Asia in the last 60 or so years since they have embraced um, more liberal economic policies to trade and how their extreme poverty rate went from very high to not very high, very quick. I think in China, it went from like 97% um, 60 years ago to less than one or 2% today. And that's what could happen in Africa. And you've got all, so many right things. You've got resources, you've got young, intelligent people. All that's missing is the policies. Yeah. And once the policies are changed um, and the young generation, I think are the big movers of this, as I mentioned, the idea of African socialism and its continuation is a legacy that has been that happened after colonialism. And now that those older leaders are beginning to pass on to the younger generation, 
who do not have the same hatred of capitalism in many circumstances anyway, that could be the push for Africa, African policies and ideology needs to really get the ball rolling and eradicate extreme poverty, hopefully within a few decades. One area of, I guess, potential concern for people, you know, people living in, in African countries is regarding trade with other partners. So China, for example, the US, the UK. Um, as far as you know, what implications are there of the agreement for trade with, with other countries? Is it still a case of it's up to each sort of African government to decide for itself who it wants to trade with? Or do you, as far as you know, are there any um, broader implications? Well, the, at the moment with free trade area, no. But the free trade area does have plans to eventually become a customs union, okay. um, which would mean that if a customs, big African customs union was to trade with another country, it would involve all the member states. Whereas for now, as it's a free trade area, um, that isn't the case. But the free trade area becoming a customs union probably will be quite a few decades. If, if we have to wait till 2034 for the 90% tariffs to be removed, it's you could probably bet it'll be a few more decades before that happens. So at the moment, no, um, it's down to the regional economic community that each nation is, it is or isn't in and how that works is down to them. Um, but one interesting thing that could prove a problem with the free trade area is down to rules of origin, um, which for example, if say Kenya had a free trade agreement with the USA, the USA shipped loads of goods to Kenya. Kenya, those American goods in Kenya can't be then shipped across the free trade area tariff free because the 90% reduction in tariffs only applies to goods made in Africa, goods or services made in Africa. However, the problem with that is a lot of countries don't really have the customs mechanisms to, to really prove or enforce rules of origin. So that is a problem. Um, I'm sure you can imagine going to various borders, uh, especially between poor African states, trying to prove that your various goods are, no, they're actually made in Rwanda, they weren't made in China. It's quite difficult. However, hopefully they can get over that. It's down to their talks that are happening, uh, continuing at the moment. And um, on the, I mean, on that specific point, you run into something that has plagued movement in Africa for decades is just corruption at borders where you have to you know if you have the funds for it you can convince the officials that your goods are are all fine and you can uh, you know you can move across and that kind of thing if you don't have those the extra funds i mean big corporates and companies can have that extra funding to facilitate the bribes but for small i don't know independent little businesses they don't have that so I think that's a very important point. Um, I hope yeah. the agreement will have some sort of effect on, I guess, endemic corruption. Yeah, my, my, one of my hopes, it's harder to quantify in a way, but if a free trade area adds certainty to, especially smaller and larger businesses, both of them, if it adds certainty to them that they know that they can cross their good across that border, and it will either be no tariff or a set tariff, whatever it may be, hopefully no tariff. It means when they get to the border and they're suddenly told, oh, you have to pay this amount to get past. They can turn around and say, no, we know this to be the rules because it just simplifies a lot. So that's my hope because at the moment it's very arbitrary. You can go to, a, you can go to some borders and be charged or be charged nothing and just be told to pass on through. Other times they'll take half of what you're bringing in. So I hope it adds certainty, will add to innovation because it will mean basically at the moment, if you're uncertain, you're not going to take a risk to start up an enterprise, to cross the border, to sell your goods into another market. Whereas if you know for sure what the situation is, you're more likely to do that. Um, so that's a, that's a very good sign and fingers crossed that'll be the case. From the UK perspective, and now I'm going to make you the representative of the UK government here on this, on this podcast. Um, is there sort of enthusiasm for the for the potential of this area? Has there been any movement? I, I mean, all governments have been preoccupied with COVID for the last year at least, and even before then, you know, it tended to be 
a lot of, I mean, Africa sort of came last in the level of importance in terms of policies and engagement kind of thing generally. Um, but has there been any sort of indication from the UK government regarding this? Um, so in short, I don't think so. Mm. Um, looking at all the major newspapers in the UK, there has been virtually no um, discussion about the free trade area, which makes me very sad as I uh, spend a lot of time trying to let people know about it and doing things like this and writing about it to try and popularize it and m make people support or not make, um, hopefully persuade people to be supportive. Um, we will force uh, people to support our liberal <laughs> ideals. <laughs> yeah, take over the world so we can leave you alone. Yeah. Um, that's the idea for libertarians. <laughs> so, but um, Liz Truss, who's our trade secretary, is very supportive of free trade. Um, maybe she has released a small statement on it. I haven't seen it, so I don't think she has, but I'm sure she would probably be supportive. Don't put words in her mouth. Um, so as we're adopting the new global Britain after Brexit free trade agenda, I think it will be good for us um, and we will be supportive. But I think either you're right that governments have been distracted by COVID and there's been a lot on, especially in the UK, when it comes to trade, we have to set up all these various trade agreements. Um, but my hope is in days, in future times, um, there'll be a lot of discussion around it at hopefully various dinners and events throughout the UK when we're allowed to do so again. Yeah, I think that sounds very good. I mean, this is, in a way, it's the, the culmination of the last, as you say, two years or so of, I guess, discussions and that sort of thing between um, African countries. But now it's the, the actual beginning of what this area could mean for the continent and hopefully for other countries around the world who choose to engage with African countries and the potential that they have. Um, I think we've covered most of the aspects I wanted to, to focus on on the area. Is there anything else that you wanted to highlight? I should just say, um, thank you for asking, that even though we've got a lot of members signed on at the moment, about 37, as I said at the beginning, ish ratified, 34, definitely. Um, the worry is that some of these states ha aren't really supportive of free trade and right. have kind of joined the area in order to get a seat at the table and to persuade negotiations. And I think one good example of that is, is Nigeria. They said they weren't going to ratify previously, then they held an inquiry and decided to do so. But they aren't a free trading country and even they've shut down their borders to many neighboring countries in right. recent times to, and prevented trade with them. So there is a worry that they're doing so just to kind of get some sort of power and aren't fully supportive of the ideas. And I think that's why it's so important for Africans, for various think tanks in Africa and across the world, um, various commentators and politicians in African governments and and two across the world, sure, let's include everyone, um, really try and hold the, go the governments who have ratified this agreement accountable. And right. so that the worry is in time with many non-free trading countries around the table, it could be watered down. And the, say 97% of tariffs turns into 80 over time, turns into 40. Um, and I think history does show that with some of the customs unions in Africa, there's 13 different regional economic communities. Um, and they like to say they're free trade, but in reality, the only one that really is, is the Southern African um, SACU in Southern Africa. So history doesn't tell a great tale of the free trade potential between economic communities in Africa, but let's spend the next few years really trying to hold the governments in Africa accountable to what they ratified, not to change it, to stay true to these free trading principles. Um, and if they do so, the benefits that the World Bank predicts will likely come true. Not exactly, but in a large part, things will get better for a lot of people very quickly. Not often that I say this, but this episode has definitely taken me on a bit of an emotional roller coaster. Thanks, to Alex. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> um, I think the yeah, the takeaway, the key takeaway for me is the potential of the area, what it could mean if we hold our governments accountable. Um, and 
I think it boils down, a lot of stuff ultimately boils down to citizens holding their government accountable. Uh, they are, after all, here to protect our rights. That's the first duty of a government is to protect people's rights. And after, you know, after that, they can, if they have the fiscal room, they can provide services if they think it's a good thing. But firstly, you know, protecting property rights, the rule of law, um, enforcing constitutions, that kind of thing. And hopefully the area is another, the, the agreement itself is another impetus for governments to do, to do that. Um, I think there's a great temptation after COVID for governments to turn inward, to be isolationist, to just focus on their own like, quote unquote issues. But, you know, in a very connected, interconnected world, the more you engage with your neighbors, the more you can spread those fibers, as it were, across borders, I think the more resilient and stronger various economies and ultimately people's lives will be. Um, I think supply chains, that kind of thing, they've shown just how resilient they have been under COVID and why not strengthen them across the African continent even more and make it easier for, for citizens to survive um, unexpected crises like COVID. I, um, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I'm not going to give you the the room to to disagree with me on anything. So I think we'll we'll end the episode on that note. Unless you had any parting thoughts about anything we covered or anything else you wanted to leave us with. No, I think I think I'm good. Let's together go forth, embrace Africa's new era of liberalism, but keep the governments accountable to what they ratified, and hopefully things will be okay soon. On that uh, very good note, I think uh, viewers and listeners, thank you for joining us, Alex. Thank you once again for your time. It's always invaluable getting to talk to you and getting your insights. We greatly value your expertise. Um, viewers and listeners to you, please rem remember to like the video. Please share it and please also subscribe to our channel. We greatly appreciate all the support that you give us and we'll talk to you again in the upcoming weeks. But for now, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris.